Hello and thanks for joining us on Encore. Coming up on today's film show, Psychic Sisters and the Spectre of War in Planetarium. French thriller Iris turns the kidnap narrative on its head and a man and a woman returns to Parisian screens 50 years later. We won't reveal to you anything that you don't already know. Let's enjoy it while it lasts. I'm joined by our film critic Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Olivia. Well, we're starting with a film that's out this week in France. It's called Planetarium, and it stars Natalie Portman and Lily Rose Depp as American sisters who were mediums here in Paris in the 1930s. So it certainly sounds fantastic on paper. Would you say the planets were in alignment for this one? <laughs> well. This movie is kind of like a whole film school course condensed into one two-hour package. It has a terrific basic idea. The cast includes some wonderful actors. The underlying themes and the historical underpinnings are inherently fascinating. The writer-director's two previous films were quite good, and yet the result is almost completely off-kilter. Some would go so far as to say jaw-droppingly bad. This is a crash course in what not to do. Website IndieWire called it a star-studded board when it played the Toronto Film Festival. So in Berlin and then Paris, between the wars, Portman plays Laura Barlow, the, the MC of cabaret shows and seances, in which her younger sister Kate appears to have a genuine gift for contacting the departed. Portman acquits herself quite well speaking French, by the way, as the act's manager. Now the sisters meet one Andre Corbin, a very well played by Emmanuel Salinger. He's a prominent French movie producer and studio honcho intent on using a movie camera uh, to use film to actually record a ghostly apparition. He believes that's possible. Like I said, incredibly good raw material in a blend, French and English. And by the way, it's been uh, assembled here. It barely stands and a, a ghost of a chance. Let's take a look. Je veux plus que tu You're jealous. <gasps> rien compris. We won't reveal to you anything that you don't already know. Stay with me. Who's ready to answer me? J'ai l'impression que t'es devenu complètement fou en même temps. J'ai tenté quelque chose. Honestly? Is it a spirit? And what about you? Well, it's certainly getting a lot of critical support here in France, so maybe what doesn't work is this issue of French and English language happening at the same time. Now, Francois Cat sat down with the two lead actresses, here's Natalie Portman, on taking up that linguistic challenge. Give me a lot of respect for the people who do it so well, like Marion Cotillard or, or Penelope Cruz, and you're just like, wow, to be able to emote like that in a language that's not your your mother tongue is is um, very admirable. Uh, J'ai dû uh, parler en français faire enfin faire semblant que je savais pas parler français parce que évidemment mon personnage est c'est une spiritualiste uh, américaine. Donc du coup, c'était enfin c'était drôle sur le plateau essayer de le dire dans une façon pas trop français pour que ça pour que ça enfin pour que ça soit enfin c'est genre uh, believable. <laughs> J'ai oublié mon mot en français. <laughs> Now, interestingly, the central characters are loosely based on real people. The Fox sisters were American spiritualists who were active in the mid to late 1800s, and they used a rapping technique. Spirit, are you there to convince seance attendees that they were communicating with the afterworld? Uh, the character Emmanuel Salinger plays uh, in the film is based on Bernard Natton, a naturalized French citizen from Romania, an incredibly important man who was, dedicated, who was decorated for valor in World War I, went on to buy the Pate Film Studio, uh, brought sound films to, to France and was subjected to incredible anti-Semitic hazing and was one of the first people deported to Auschwitz. Unfortunately, his tragic life is more interesting than this entire film. Oh, what a shame. So, certainly sounds like some fantastic raw material. Now, another film out in France this week is a French film, entirely in French, no English there. It's called <laughs> Iris. Now, looking at the description, it sounds a bit like Fifty Shades of Grey meets Wall Street. Uh, money and sex, I presume. <laughs> well, it's closer to that 
that than say Mothra meets Godzilla, uh, but that's pretty off the mark, uh, uh, although the tale does entail uh, obsessive sexual practices, always good for, for films, and French banking, and there's at least one dead body. Um, this is the new film directed by very talented French actor Julie Lisper, who made his mark back in 1999 in a film called Human Resources, and who did an excellent job in 2014 of directing the film Yves Saint Laurent, which he also co-wrote, and which Charlotte Le Bon, who is the female lead here, also appeared. Now, this movie is diabolical, but not sufficiently clever. When a wealthy banker's wife is kidnapped, the kidnapper asks aloud, what if something goes wrong? Only to be told, that's impossible. Oh, okay. Well, of course, a great many things do go wrong, depending on whether you're the kidnapper, the wife, the banker, the mistress, or the two cops assigned to the case. Charlotte Le Bon is called upon to do a dominatrix act in the kind of unmarked sex club that all European capital cities seem to have, at least in the movies. She looks quite fetching in her work clothes, and uh, and we believe her to be mm -mm, whip smart. Uh, but it is possible that the debt-ridden auto mechanic, played by Roman Duris, has more than one trick up his greasy sleeve. Director Les Spare plays the banker whose wife vanishes from a fancy restaurant, and the film has fun with the physical resemblance uh, between the two male leads, which they play up on the uh, poster. Now, when I saw this at a screening several days before the U.S. election, I wrote in my notes that the film isn't really that good, because in the end it doesn't make sense. But I think the prospect of Donald Trump as president has actually altered my approach to assessing movies insofar that Iris, like the U.S. election, starts out entertaining and suspenseful, then falls apart and ends badly. And this movie ceases to make sense uh, at a certain point, but should I hold that against it when we're clearly living in a post-logic world? Almost 60 million of my fellow citizens don't seem to be overly keen on logic, so I don't think I'll hold that against this film, not be a stickler. <laughs> Logic and credibility aside, we're going to move to happier times. And in fact, 40 years ago, instead of Donald Trump being elected, Jimmy Carter was elected That's president right. of the United States. And here in France, at the same time, the cinema magazine Premiere was being created. It's still going today. Indeed it is. Uh, the French arguably ocean, oh, uh, uh, invented motion pictures, but there is no question that they are incredibly good at creating publications devoted to them. Why is that? Well, you may have heard of two dueling institutions. Cahiers du Cinema, founded in 1951 whose original critics went on to become the filmmakers of the French New Wave, and Positif, the infinitely less stodgy of the two, founded in 1952, a year later in Lyon by Bernard Chardin, and blessed with sort of a surrealist bent and way, way less susceptible to trendiness. I could add that Chardin is still with us, and uh, French critic Michel Simon has been writing for Positif for 50 years, so this is serious stuff. If you can't get enough of dialectical materialism in whatever film magazine you are seeking out, just go back to Cahiers circa 1970. Premiere, on the other hand, has always steered clear of pretentiousness and highfalutin language and dumb theories. It runs film reviews for the rank and file filmgoer and profiles and think pieces that, you know, wouldn't be difficult to translate into another language for the simple reason that they already make sense in French, which is not always the case with Cahiers. Uh, from the start, Premiere's mission was to both entertain and inform its readers without talking down to them. Premiere did that so well that the French publishers were able to launch an American edition of the magazine that thrived for a while and nurtured quite a few fine writers, and that existed in print in the U.S. from 1987 through 2007. It hung on as an online-only publication until about 2010. Uh, in addition, addition to the magazines I mentioned, there are other cinema-specialized magazines to enjoy. My opposite number on the French channel uh, here at France 24, Thomas Borez, is high on the masthead of a glossy film monthly called Studio Cine Live. In addition to Premiere, uh, I'm a faithful subscriber to this relatively new irreverent film monthly, So Film which uh, began about three years ago. So if you want to practice your French comprehension, you can go read Proust or Madame Bovary, or you can pick up Premiere. Happy birthday. <laughs> That's good news for Premiere. Now, another m important birthday for cinema. It's been 50 years since French director Claude Deluche made A Man and a Woman, a very loved love story here in France. It's having a re-release now in a restored version. Yeah, and it looks and sounds terrific. Lelouch himself is now 79 years old. He's been making roughly a film a year for 50 years. The one that's being re-released this week, uh, as you said, is called A Man and a Woman, and that's a title that is easy to translate into any language, and boy, did it translate into success for its director. It's the story of a race car driver who's a widower, who meets a con continuity woman, you know, who works on film sets, who's a widow. It shared the Golden Palm at the Cannes Film Festival, and it won two Oscars, the Best Foreign Language Film and Screenplay, and actors absolutely love to work with him, and his casts are often drool-worthy collections of talented people. I had the honor of 
conducting the post-screening discussion last month when Lelouch came to the Chicago International Film Festival, an event it turns out he helped inspire 52 years ago. And uh, the reception from people of all ages was as warm as can be. Lelouch isn't always appreciated by the critical establishment here in France, but he is very, very beloved outside of France. A Russian woman who had emigrated to the U.S. in 1975 said she saw a man and a woman in Moscow in 1957. True and all her friends had this record. You'll recognize the theme song <laughs> when we play it. Uh, and the composer Francis Lay is very well known in Russia. Now, this seemed like a major aesthetic innovation at the time, but the actual reason, uh, Lelouch admitted in Chicago, that uh, some of the film is in black and white and some of it is in color is because they didn't have enough money to buy the color film and process it. it that costs more. So it's just sort of randomly in, in those two things. Lelouch is a one-man band. He writes, he directs, he produces, and he points the camera at the action. His visceral connection to film was actually formed very, very early because as a child, uh, to keep him away from the, uh, the marauding Nazis, his mother hid him in movie theaters where he never tired of watching the same film over and over again. As in all of his films, his sheer irrepressible joy of handling the camera is front and center. And he's so. still making movies. He's editing decades, a new one five as we decades. Speak. Yeah. yeah, five <laughs> decades in the business. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us this week. We'll leave you with a clip from the 1966, sorry, Man and a Woman. Remember, you can get more arts and culture on our website and you can keep up with Encore on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Forger la carame du 